So church, grab your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Hebrews in our study on Wednesday night, Hebrews chapter three. We've been in this section, and, and you know, we've, I say we've been in this section of chapter three, verses 17 to 19, and I, I thought we would move on from the title of it, uh, but it just continues to spool up. And what I'm talking about is this topic uh, that we're seeing in chapter three that we've named the suicide of unbelief and the danger. And, and it, it seems like every week that you and I uh, meet again, there's been things that have developed that caused this to be more relevant than the week earlier. And things that are going on in the world around us in, in, in spiritual context where the Bible is under attack or, or people are saying this or some new message from some guy in, in India that, that the gods have appeared to him and he's got a message. And uh, in the Philippines or somewhere, I'm not sure, I, I just don't follow it, but there's some new Messiah that's arrived and it's like, what? All these things going on. And as a believer, if you know your Bible, you're going, yep, Bible said that would happen. And uh, so here we are, you know. But uh, as we get into this tonight, uh, there'll be, I think, a little bit of what I trust is the Lord's ministry to us regarding us being discerning and being careful as we are now in part five of the message, The Suicide of Unbelief. And leaving off where we did last time, uh, now he takes us, the author takes us into this, this area of searching the scriptures, knowing what God has given us and how Jesus Christ is altogether better and Jesus Christ is not only better than all that there can be, but Jesus Christ is God's final word. That the last thing that God has spoken to us about, you can be rest assured, is that the scripture for us at this time in our earthly existence is enough. What's interesting about what I just said is, apparently, according to the Gospels, the Bible tells us that all that has been written for our learning has been given, and it implies for us to live this life spiritually successful. In other words, for us to finish the course that God has given us. But what the scriptures also, I was going to use the word elude, but that's too mild. The scriptures point to the future that what we're going to know about God in eternity uh, will, will blow our minds, not really, but you know what I mean. That what he has said to us now about his love is so much that you and I cannot wrap our minds around it, but it's nothing compared to what you're going to learn about his love. And take every topic and every issue. Look, call me crazy, go ahead, it's fine, but I believe that even translates into uh, God's handiwork regarding sound or color or taste. I think when you and I get to heaven, when we're there with him, everything will be radically intensified, or I should say, reverting back to what was his normal for us as his kids. We'll be talking about some of that stuff tonight in studying for this, uh, the wonderful theologian. He's now in heaven now. I love this guy, Charles C. Ryrie, Charles Ryrie of Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, whatever book he's ever written, if you come across a, a Charles Ryrie book, buy it. It's safe theology. He was profound but I, I was blessed today reading one of his books because you know that this series has been called The Suicide of Unbelief. He called this chapter The Catastrophe of Unbelief. And I got all excited because I kind of remotely had a thought like Charles Ryrie. <laughs> but it's, uh, the, the similarities end at that right there. But, uh, <laughs> but the single most important issue, friends, of your life, without exaggeration, is... Not only what you believe, but for us in this room as believers, the single most important activity in your life is not a thing that you do, it's a person that resides in you as a believer. According to the Bible, the God of the universe dwells inside his children, and that is God the Holy Spirit. And we've been talking a lot, you know that, we covered 18 different points 
uh, last week together regarding the Holy Spirit. And he is absolutely essential in your life for growth and maturity, holiness, power, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, for vision. Listen, your life, your family, the church that you attend will perish without vision. And the Holy Spirit is the author of vision. It's the Holy Spirit that communicates to you purpose, fulfillment in life, and ultimately heaven. And so as we get into this, let's stand for the reading of the word. And we're reading the big full body of it, but we're we're studying such a small portion of it tonight. But Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 19, uh, you guys know this almost by heart now, but it's good for us to to just have it down. I'll read verse 7. If you pick it up in verse 8, on we go. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice... Where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Verse 11, so I swore in my wrath. Think about that. God's wrath is holy. It's pure. It's perfect. It's not anger. It's wrath. It's his deity. They shall not enter my rest. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpse fell in the wilderness? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And that is a terrifying statement. Again, Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So yeah, we spent something like four weeks or so looking at verse 7 and just those opening words, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and we've been looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. Church, tonight we pick it up in verses 7 to 11, and we'll see how far we get on this, but regarding the suicide of unbelief, number two, we look at this, and that's, that is this sense of urgency. Can you write that down? This sense of urgency. He says there in verse 7, today, if you will hear his voice, And he goes on to say and warn about hardening your hearts. And we'll look at that if we get a chance to in a moment. But the fact of the matter is, verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice. And I want to talk tonight about the human responsibility of who we are as those who listen and hear and the grace of God. When it says today, if you will hear his voice, this is a very technical and serious term. Now, I know that on Wednesday nights here, I'm talking to the choir, so to speak, or maybe literally. But you've made time to come out in the midweek to go into a Bible study. And, uh, and that's great, and so that should be. And what we want to take out of here is a deeper understanding of a God's word. And I'm telling you right now that as we look at this, just the word today, there's, there's key words here, today. Another word is if, and the other word is hear. The other word again, voice. These are super powerful, charged words that are speaking to us regarding a great sense of urgency. So as we go into this study tonight, church, listen, if you and I do not have a sense of biblical urgency in our lives, then we need to address that with God alone by ourselves. It does no good to talk about it to anybody else. It doesn't doesn't do any good to share with anybody else. It's the issue of you getting 
uh, a word from God, uh, a touch from God to excite you about the things of God all over again. Igniting your passion for God again. The urgency. We talked about it on Sunday, but it applies even today from Romans to Hebrews tonight is the fact that you and I are living at a time where the temptation for us to fold our hands and push back is getting really strong. And it's going to get stronger. What we want to be careful is that we maintain a holy sense of urgency. Urgency that is in what is good and what is right. So mark this down if you would. We look at it this, uh, this way. In the, the, the three words that are important to us. Today. The word today means as in like right now. Today. When you watch this, when you hear what you're hearing, that's important. God holds you and I accountable that the moment we hear something, it is for us now to own, for us to assimilate into our lives. So there's this sense of urgency today. The next word is if. That means, watch this, if meaning, uh, what will you choose to do about this? In my notes, I wrote down if, placing the pro-choice factor of salvation on us. Think about that. Hear me out, everybody. I deliberately put that in there. God says, if you will follow me, right? God says, if you will obey me, if you will listen, if you will hear, if. This ought to wake everyone, else, everyone up right now to the fact that God does not pre-wire people for heaven and pre-wire some people for hell. Amen. This is very important. You understand this. There are some who say, there's, gee, even if you wanted to go to heaven, you can't go because uh, in, in God's foreknowledge, you, ha you have not been predestined. Sorry. First of all, nobody knows that but God alone. And if you have a heart pluck, if there's a, if there's a tweak in your mind or heart to pursue God... That is God reaching out to you, okay? Now, there are some people that you and I know, they don't want anything to do with God. They never have, they never, they never will. They just don't want anything to do with God. Oh, see, God pre-wired them to go to hell. That's why they're that way. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God, based upon his predestination, which is based upon his foreknowledge of all things. God has foreknowledge. His foreknowledge precedes him predestined anything. It's that, I know it's, it sounds complicated, but it's not. It's exactly this way. If you and I were to watch a game of, of uh, whatever, it doesn't matter, two teams playing, and, um, and you watch the, you, you record it, but see, I know, I know which team won, but I don't tell you that. So you come over and say, hey, you want to watch the World Series final game, game seven? Yeah, sure. And I come over to your house. Now, church, I'm making this up right now, okay? So don't, don't take me literally on this. And I'm not condoning anything here. If you were to say, hey, let's, let's bet 50 bucks. Who you, you, let's bet 50 bucks. You pick a winner. Let's bet. Pick a winner. So wait, before we even do this, you've not seen the game? No, I recorded it. DVR, man, because here's the... Let's watch it. And you want to bet on the game. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll take... I'll take the Dodgers. Okay, so... No, don't get excited. I'm no fan of... I'm, I'm a fan of whatever free ticket I have. <laughs> true so I'm sorry but that's it and then not only that but once I get the free ticket I'm the fan of the team that wins the game that's like reverse that's reverse of what I'm trying to say what I'm saying is this if I know that they win the world series and you don't know I know and I don't tell you that I know where am I going to place my money because I know who's going to win I'm going to place it on the Dodgers because I know they're going to win. Why did I do that? Because based on foreknowledge, I predestined in my bet that the Dodgers win. 
He already knows how this ends. He doesn't make you make choices. God knows the choices that you're going to make next month for lunch on Tuesday, and he's going to know the very second you're going to bite into whatever that thing is. You don't even know yet. Seriously. That's who he is. So when we talk about today, if in the hearing of the gospel, immediately in our time, we're now responsible. So listen, somebody may be here tonight saying, no, I don't really care about this stuff. I understand that. We all understand that. But understand this, or at least hear this. God loves you enough that his son died on the cross for your sins. And Jesus rose again from the dead. So he bought the ticket by his blood and by the empty tomb so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. So he offers you the ticket. That's the gospel, friends. And you can come and take the ticket or reject it. That's the if on you. That's the if. I don't want to take the ticket. You don't have to take the ticket. Just know this. The ticket was bought and paid for to keep you out of hell. I don't want the ticket. Don't take the ticket then. You don't have to. No one's going to make you take the ticket. But if you want the ticket, then God knows from eternity past that when the offer would be heard in your ears, you would exercise choice. And that's why that word if is right there. Today, if. And then that other word here, very powerful. That word means to listen to his voice. To care enough to want to ask the question, is God speaking? Does the God of the Bible speak? Does this God that you claim to worship speak? Does he have a mouth? Can he talk? Oh, yes, absolutely. And so the Bible here is telling us regarding our responsibility to him as a human and the grace of God which is a remarkable, awesome thing. Now, church, this is going to be a long read. I got a, I got a couple of long reads tonight, but I, I hope this comes together. I hope this works out right. The whole thing right now is urgency. Regarding this, this danger and this suicide of unbelief, we want to now stoke the flames of our hearts. Peter tells us in another place that we need to have fervent hearts for God and fervent hearts for one another. The word... Uh, Fervent is where we get uh, the, the word to, to boil or like a cauldron. God wants our, ha our hearts like a cauldron. By the way, side note, have you ever read in the book of Revelation when Jesus says to uh, Laodicea, I wish, I wish your hearts were hot. I wish you were hot or cold. Isn't that interesting? You ever, did you ever wonder, wait a minute. Because it technically means you're a blessing to me if you're hot. You're a blessing to me if you're cold. Did you ever think of that, the cold being a blessing? The reason why Jesus said that is because where that church that he wrote to was situated, it was situated at the point where two rivers came together. It was, think of it like a Mercedes-Benz logo. You know that shape? Laodicea was just like that. And cold water flowed from the mountains of the, where Mount Olympia is in that region of the world, and the hot waters flowed from this very awesome area that's still there today where there's these hot tubs, natural hot tubs with therapeutic waters. And people still go there today, they've been there for thousands of years, and, and you, you soak in these these waters that have minerals and it's hot and, and it's healing. Or you go and you get a scoop of the ice cold melted snow water that comes from the mountain. But here's what happens. When those two tributaries come together, they form a larger waterway and nobody in that region uses that water for anything. You can't use it for farming and you can't use it for drinking. Because when the cold water reaches that water that flows out of those mineral springs, it's, it's very bitter to the taste and it's very unhealthy. It causes, you know what, if you drink it. <laughs> that's, why I'm not, listen, that's why Jesus said, I wish you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, what do you do if you think you got some giardia or some poison in your mouth? You spit all over the place. 
don't you? You spit, you go, oh, no, no, spit. And Jesus, the word that Jesus used, the King James says that I'll spew you out of your mouth. That's like, it sounds like a woman wrote it. I, I'll spew. That's how women throw up. Excuse me, I'm not feeling well. I have to spew. A guy hurls. The word that Jesus used is the word to hurl. I will hurl you out of my mouth, vomit you out of my mouth. Remarkable, powerful. The danger of us knowing the truth and then not taking it up urgently. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. This is a long read, stay with me. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, he's waiting for the ministry team, his spirit, Paul, the apostle, on the inside, something was wrong. He was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue, argued, the word is uh, apologetics, with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily. So he's just sharing the Lord all over the place with those who happen to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what is this babbler want to say? Or what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of a foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Check this out. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Here's a little commentary, verse 21. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They're a bunch of, they're a bunch of uh, uh, gossips that are highly educated. Pontificators. That's what they are. Then, ver uh, verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. So imagine this, there's a pedestal. They got all these pedestals with gods on them on the roadway, lined on both sides. If you take a tour there, you'll see it. They've got them reassembled. But there was one that didn't have an image on it. It just had the pedestal. And on the pedestal, instead of it saying Zeus or Titan or uh, Trident or Athena or Diana, right? This one said to the unknown God. They did that because if you offend a God, then you're toast. So they're covering their bases. Do you know what this religion is called? Anybody? It's called pantheism. Pan. I'll cover all of the gods. I'll worship them all, try to appease them all. And somehow it'd be good with me if I just worship a little bit from each of their offerings that they have. You know, there's people like that. They go from church to spiritual gathering, to mosque, to synagogue, to church, to some enlightenment center. Always take, and then they have this thing put together in their head. They sample a little bit of everything from religions. They're pantheists. And it's a type of deception for sure. And so, to the unknown God, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, he was being very generous there, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood, listen, any nurses, doctors, chemists, biologists in this room? That is a scientific statement, ladies and gentlemen. If you are a hematologist... You just read in verse 26 a 2,000 year old statement that is 100% scientifically true. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. 
and he has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. I know that's not going to go over big. That statement means that God has put borders to nations. Pfft. Wow. Remember that? Remember that concept? So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might, listen, grow. Watch verse 27. So that, they might, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. You could see Paul go like this, gold or silver or stone. Imagine, wouldn't you love to have seen this happening? I'd love this. Something shaped by art or man's devising, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Change your mind. That's what that word means, metanoia. Change the way you think. Why? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, who has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. What an incredible, that's a sermon you just got from Paul. Apologetics, witnessing, he rebuked them, he exhorted them, and he gave them the answer. He gave them the gospel truth. He delivered the goods. But verse 27 has to do with our study tonight regarding who we are and God's grace. Verse 27 of Acts 17 says, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Today, if you will hear his voice. That's a sense of urgency. Today. The urgency of hearing his voice. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Listen to this. Paul says, we then, as workers together with him, that is God, also plead with you, plead, that's urgent, not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I've heard you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do you hear the urgency in that? Sometimes we hear the gospel and we like, oh, whatever. Maybe, I might believe that, but I'll think about it. And we need to be careful about that. As believers, if you're a believer tonight, uh, thank God and praise the Lord for that. And what you want to do is build upon this strength and this truth about our God and his grace. But the challenge should be for each and every one of us here tonight that you're not sure where you're at with Christ. Is a vital, vital challenge that you would ask yourself tonight have I heard the voice of God? Am I even interested in hearing from the voice of God? And so Paul tells the Corinthians that when you hear the gospel go forth, now's the time, today's the day. Philippians chapter two, verse eight. Listen to the sense of urgency in hearing God's voice. Philippians two, eight through 11. Speaking of Jesus, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Listen, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth and of those under the earth. Creepy, yeah? In the spirit realm. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a sense of urgency. When you hear the name of Jesus, what do you do? When you hear the gospel, what do you think? Does it spark your heart? Does it bring you to the place of, I need to do something about this? I told you this before. I, I've, I've said it many times over the years. Billy Graham was asked one time, are you ever afraid that when you preach that nobody comes forward? And he says, no, I'm not even interested. I don't, I don't. I'm not concerned about people coming forward. And they were surprised. Don't you think that's the whole point of the crusade? Is that people would get up and come forward? Billy Graham didn't think so. Billy Graham said this. 
if I am faithful to preach the gospel and bring people to the point of decisions, there will be some decisions yes and some no. What they do with the challenge is their business. My job is to bring them to the place of decision. That's, a, that's an awesome and very liberating way to approach our ministry as believers. We are not to coerce people into the kingdom of God. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Just say the prayer, will you? Just say the prayer. Don't ever do that to somebody. That's horrible. You and I are supposed to give the truth and let the decision be made by them. We're not responsible for their decision. We're responsible for presenting the truth. And that's what we must do. Urgency and hearing God's voice. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Acts 2, 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, Peter is speaking, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Isn't that great? Think about that for a moment. Peter spoke, them, spoke the truth. So clearly in the crowd, there are people who were earlier that week shouting, right? Or uh, that month, because this is Pentecost, is now past. So Peter must look into the crowd and he sees people. And he says to them, you're the ones that were shouting, crucify him. Now you think about that for a minute. I don't think you would learn that tactic in seminary. Now, here's what you want to do when you preach. You want to make sure that you... <laughs> Peter, don't do that. That's negative church growth tactics. <laughs> you think he cares? He speaks the truth. Hey, I know some of you out there crucified Jesus. You were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Well, he goes on to say this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What does that mean? They were convicted and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. If that message was preached in most churches today, they'd fire Peter for preaching it. Wouldn't they think about it? You're going to upset people with that. There was a group who were, con they were convicted in the heart, and they said, what do we do? Listen, the sense of urgency regarding what we're talking about here in the book of Hebrews, today, if you'll hear his voice, should spark within you the question, do I hear his voice? Do I know how to hear the voice of God? Do I know, do I know how to discern the voice of God from the voice of Satan or the world? Do I know how to do that? The believer is to know how to do that. More Bible, more ability to do that. So much Bible all the time at this church. Bible, Bible. So many verses. Listen, these verses will save our lives. Literally. And forever. I mean it. But can't you just tell us like five points to how to get rich? Wrong church. In fact, actually, if you do follow the five points, if I ever give five points, I guess they are the way to get rich. You can't get more rich than inherit heaven. Right? So I guess, I, guess, I guess this is my one point on how to get rich. You know? But when it comes to the things of God, church, I want to I wanna use this moment, and, you, and it's, I think it's necessary, that when we consider these things of God that are so important that we hear, we need to remember that there's an invisible war that's going on constantly around our lives. And part of that invisible war, I know you don't think so, but the invisible world that you and I live in begins with our thought life. You know, our thoughts are invisible. They're so real to us, and they are real to us, but nobody else sees them but God only. But you, and you're thinking, you have your thoughts going, and your plans, or your whatever, they're all in here. But there's an invisible war going on in here. 
I mean, think about what's going, think about the, the thoughts that you hear and, and the deception tactics that are going on. Many of you have been Christians long enough to discern the voice of Satan. And here's the amazing thing about the voice of Satan. Do you know what the voice of Satan sounds like? The answer is yourself. He uses your tone in your own head. Do you understand? How to recognize his voice is not the tone as much as it is the syntax and text of what he is saying. It's what's being said. Notice, when you're tempted, is there another voice in your head that's, when you're being tempted, is it like, hi, big guy. <laughs> feeling, kind of, feeling kind of sad tonight and bored. <laughs> Satan doesn't talk like that. Satan uses that stuff with your sound of your voice. You ever think of that? He's like, man, have you ever had a bad thought or like a, a, a thought that's insane? I remember I just got saved. I just got saved. It was my first Sunday at church. And I'm, and I'm in church. This is amazing. I got saved. And I'm so excited. First Sunday. I'll never forget it because of what happened. And I had this thought just fly across my head. What? what if Pastor Chuck fell over dead right now? And it was like, what? Where did that come from? Have any of you ever had a weird thing like that? Okay, now I got you, finally. Okay. The, listen, Satan will launch stuff into your head like that. A suggestion. Listen. I know that in our lives, I can only speak for men, but how is it that I could be looking at something completely fascinated and I can even be told, don't take your eyes off that thing. And the moment it meet, it, that it hits 50, you know, turn it off. And I'm looking. And how is it that before you even know, it's almost like your head's been pulled over there and there's something right there for a millisecond that you ought not to see. Can any man in here be honest enough to say Amen. Isn't it weird? You're like this. You're like this. Okay, get ready. We're going to jump right at 50. We're going to jump. Okay, we're going to jump. And then you go. <laughs> Look, I'm being honest for every guy in here that's lying right now. <laughs> what happened? What was that? That was, that was the enemy tempting and attacking. Amen. He knew something was over there. He knew I was fixed on that. But he wanted to drop a bomb. He wanted to launch a missile. This invisible war is directed against the souls of all mankind. Believer or not. If you're not a believer, he's going to keep you bound so that you never become one. If you are a believer, he's going to keep attacking to keep you neutral or sterile so you don't reproduce other Christians in your life. And he's very effective at this time in the world among the Christian community by silencing them with intimidation tactics, fear tactics. Ge uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I hope this comes together. We need to I need to go faster. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Listen. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Do you hear that, everybody? Humans are supposed to be the custodians of the earth. We don't worship it. And it's not our mother, for crying out loud. Look, if you're an evolutionist, you got your own issues. But if, you, if you're somebody else that says, you, you need to, we, need to, we need to worship our mother earth, okay? That's, I have more respect for the evolutionist than for somebody that has that kind of a view. <laughs> That's, that's, that's insane. So God created man in his own image, and in the image God created him, male and female. Amen. Boy, this is the Bible. Now you see why people will probably outlaw the Bible right there. 
He created them. Verse 28. Then God blessed them. And here's the whopper. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That means make people. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's what God said. Okay? This is what God said. God says, I created life. This is the way it works. Go for it. That was never said of angels. Only humans. Genesis 3, 24. Adam and Eve now sin. They, they rebel against God. Verse 24, chapter 3. So he, God, drove out the man and he placed cherubim. See the I am on the word cherub? Cherub is one cherub, one rank of this angelic type, a cherub. And they're gnarly. See, so my grandma's got cherub over the bathroom <laughs> sink. Those are cupids or something. They're not cherubs. A cherub, a cherub is fatal. A cherub is terrifying. A cherub is one. When you see in Hebrew the I am on the end, that's plural. We don't know. We know this. The cherub, he placed cherubim, meaning at least two. I, what? What's going on here? He placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden. And, this is weird, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Technically, there's multiple cherubim surrounding, guarding some, somehow the tree of life. And there's something that is a flaming sword. So imagine this flaming sword is spinning about in every way. And it is guarding the tree of life. Why? Because if Adam and Eve in their fallen condition got through to that tree. Remember they, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? That was the thing they weren't supposed to do. They only knew good. They just couldn't leave it alone. They only knew good. And Satan tempted them to know evil. The other tree was the tree of life. If they would have had access to the tree of life in the fallen condition, you and I would have lived forever in a state of death, mayhem, warfare, violence, horror. Imagine that. God, even in the fall, God protect, protected us from living like this. That for the believer, this whole process of this life, thank God, has got to run its course. And when it ends, we die. And the believer is set free. The Bible says we're set free. But man, God in his mercy set up this incredible, electrified, personified fence around the tree of life. Hebrews 1 verse 13 says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not, listen, angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? You have, if you're a believer, you have an angel that's assigned to your life. At least one. Some of us need more than one. Psalm 104, beginning to verse 3. Psalm 104, verse 3. You lay out the rafters of your home in the rain clouds. <laughs> you make the clouds your chariot. You ride upon the wings of the wind. He, uh, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. Angels. Interesting. See, why are you talking about this? Because listen, angels... Satan, demons, and our existence as mankind, we are all in this battlefield that we need to realize that you and I having doubt or you and I not being able to hear the voice of God, accepting his message or rejecting his message is a world that's being played out in real time for you and I. And there's two spiritual realms that oppose one another and it's all for this reason. Watch this, it's kind of radical but it's happening. One is so in love with you and who you are that he even died to give you life and forgiveness to bring you into his presence, but he won't bend your arm. 
to make the decision. The other one, listen, the other one, according to the scripture, has been completely defeated regarding the winning of this war. The war has already been determined. That when Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, the Bible says that Satan was defeated. The, listen, the end of the war has been determined, but the battles, well, you and I live through the battles. And the battle is this. Satan cannot win the war, so what does he do? He goes about inflicting the heart of God by deceiving you, by blinding you, by getting people to commit suicide or to not believe or to, to wander off into rogue religions, uh, to, to be legalistic, to do anything but to come to Christ in simple faith alone. Are you with me? Are you tracking me? If Satan's defeated, why doesn't he just pack up and go home? Because he hates beyond our ability to ever imagine hate. And he so cannot stand God that the way to get at God is to go after you. True. You know this actually in life. Yes. If you're a parent, would you, have, would you have somebody with a knife attack you or your five-year-old? You don't even have to think about it. In fact, you know why I know that? Because if some lunatic is coming after somebody with a knife, the parent gets in the way. Are you with me? No greater love than a man has than a man lay down his life for his friends. You don't have to ask a, a, a mother or a father to protect their child. It's going to happen. Okay? And they'll kill you if need be if you're coming after their kid. Absolutely. Listen, on a little scale... God is reaching out in that sacrificial love. But in a real way, Satan is coming after you with a hatred so overdeveloped and angst. Not so much at you. He actually doesn't hate you. He doesn't care about you. He hates God so much that he knows that if he rips out your life and you never come to faith, or he, he sterilizes you after you come to faith, and you don't procreate, that is, reproduce other Christians in your life, then you know what? Satan can go, ha, ha, silence that one for you. How about this one? His hatred is that much. It's absolutely remarkable. Why is that the case? I can't believe, listen, we're gonna go, we're gonna go fast. <laughs> this is the reason. We're gonna, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11. What's with him? And why do we need to know this information? Why do we need to be weary about unbelief? And why do we need to know the voice of God? Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Watch this, everybody. There's a physical king of Tyre, a real person, a human. Watch how this goes. And say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, Perfect in beauty. What? You were in Eden. I guarantee you, the king of Tyre on the Lebanese coast was never in the Garden of Eden. What's going on here? The Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. The Hebrew words suggest that around the lung area, the chest cavity, are pipes or uh, like organ pipes. Timbrels, tambourine, a timbrel is a tambourine. This is weird, would you agree this is weird? You are the anointed, who, what? Cherub. You are the anointed cherub who covers, who, who's supreme, number one, top dog, top cherub. I established you. You were on the mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Notice he's created. Till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading manipulation, you became filled with violence within you, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing, out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. 
O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings. Incredible statement. Would you all agree? That's weird. It starts out with the lamentation regarding the king of Tyre, which is a real place on earth. Behind the king of Tyre was the operator of what was going on. It happened to be one who was a cherub who was created, and he had absolute access to God, and he was the top dog. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the furthest sides of the north. Verse 14, I will ascend above the highest of the clouds. I will be like the most high, that is God. Verse 15, you sh yet you shall be brought down to Sheol or to hell to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble and who shook kingdoms? Next, uh, yeah, uh, for, uh, verse 13, Isaiah 14, 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Lucifer, this is Satan. This is the cherub that is top. In the day that he was made, he was made perfect and more beautiful than all others. It's interesting to note that angels, the Bible says that when Satan fell at some point in time during his, in his fallen state, he was able to deceive one third of heaven's angels. We don't know that, what that number is. But friends, listen. If Satan can deceive one-third of the angelic host of heaven, don't you think that you and I need this Bible to protect us against his tactics? Real quick, real quick. I have 60 seconds. Number one, listen to this. I'll just do this fast, but number one, you guys, when, it's, when he said, I will, his first I will, I will ascend into heaven, guess what? He, want, he wanted that. Satan wanted that. And he tried to manipulate to get it. And everything, those five I wills that Satan wanted to seize for himself, all of those things that he wanted, the believer gets for free. So watch. This is a theory of mine. It's working. God created the angels long before you and I were ever created. The angels heard God say, let us make man in our image. Angels are beautiful, but they're not like us. They're not like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's, let's, make, let's make humans in our image, in our moral likeness. They'll be able to create, sing. They'll be able to dance. They'll be able to... So let's make man in our image. And the Bible says that he made us a little lower than the angels, but in the end, we will be exalted over the angels in eternity. Did you know that? I personally believe after reading this that Satan heard that. Say what? You're going to give all of this to them? To that? He was impressed with his beauty. He was impressed with his power. He was impressed with his position. He was impressed. He was, a, he was impressed. And he thought so much so, I want to be like God. I want my own throne. I will ascend to heaven. Listen, John 14 says, you and I are going to ascend to heaven. The Bible says that Jesus is coming back and picking us up and taking us to heaven. Amen. Listen. He said in his heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
Luke chapter 10, verse 19 says, Behold, I will give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the, spirits are, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. Amen. Listen to this. He said, number three, I will also sit in the mountain of the congregation or the furthest sides of the north. What is that? When you study that, Ancient scholars will tell you that that is a statement regarding antiquity and the worship of other deities and gods. The statement means this. It's not enough for me to have some power. Whatever people have ever worshiped anywhere, I want all of it for me. You say, you're making this up. Just hang on a second. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, Paul told the Corinthians, do you guys... Not know, don't you know that you shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? Did you know that, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, we're gonna judge angels when we get to heaven? Satan wants to be number one. He's not gonna be number one. Amen. Fourthly, he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. The book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 answers back and says to us, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will, <laughs> I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Satan wants his throne. He's not going to get a throne, but Jesus is going to give you a throne. Everything of those five I wills that he wanted, God gives to his kids. The final one is, I will be like the most high God. I will be like God. Any religion that says that you can become a God comes out of Genesis chapter 3. I know religions that say, if you really do good, you can become a God. Where'd that come from? Listen. Listen. The Bible tells us we do not yet know what we will be like when we see him. But we know that when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Did you know that when you and I either uh, get raptured or resurrected from the dead, we're going to be like Jesus? Amen. It doesn't mean you're God. You're going to be like him. Amen. You and I will be That individual that God desired to have made from the beginning of time itself, that in the garden we can only flirt with what is in store for us when God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. I don't know what that means, but it must be nice. And they dialogued together, talked. You're going to do that with God. Listen, we have to end. This is, it's, here's, here's the thing. Please, my friend, right now, we're gonna pray right now. Because it's late, I, I'm just gonna have you make your decision where you're at. But I'm gonna ask everyone, let's just bow our heads in an attitude of prayer. And I wanna challenge you with this, please, in this moment. If right now, that you have heard today that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead, that today, if you will hear his voice, that you will not harden your heart, but that you'd respond to him. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed and we are praying, and I'm asking you right now, friend, if today you would consider, you would judge yourself not a Christian. Religious, maybe, moral, fine, but a follower of Jesus, you can't say that for sure. But you know this, that there's a lot of voices in your head and in your life right now pulling you. And I'm going to ask you to be spiritually and intellectually honest with yourself. Can you hear in there somewhere his voice saying to you something like this? You need to accept my son. You need Jesus. You need to believe in me. 
You need to follow my son. What about Jesus? Will you consider Jesus? My dear friend, if you're hearing any form of that, that is God reaching out to you, asking you to depart from your present life into the new life that he wants for you to have, that he wants for you to enjoy and to experience. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If anyone today has that resonating in their heart, will you raise your hand as I look? Can all of us, all of us, the church, all of us, let's stand. Those of you who raised your hands, church, let's join in with them right now. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess you tonight as my ridden, risen Lord and Savior. I give you my life. I proclaim you my Lord and I follow you for the rest of my life. So help me God. In Jesus' name. Amen.